message uh, and or we've read this scripture and or we've referenced it on multiple occasions. I want you to take a look at this text from old, this piece of antiquity, and do so with a fresh look, a fresh glance, a fresh set of eyes to see what God has to say to us. Amen? Amen. St. Matthew, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, if you don't have a Bible in front of your pews, there should be Bibles that are made available and accessible to you. Amen. Convenient for you to use while you are here. Go ahead and grab one of those. And then once you have done so, might we all stand up on our feet as we reverence the word of God in both my reading and in your hearing. While you are doing that, good morning to our cyber community. For those who are watching by way of uh, social media, God bless you, and particularly YouTube. For those who refer back to our messages, we appreciate you joining in the worship experience. Amen. Once you found Matthew, the second chapter, can you signify by saying amen? Amen. If you're still looking, say wait a minute. Go right, wait a minute. If you have no idea where it is, say Lord have mercy. <laughs> right. Praise God. Matthew. And we're going to look at the second chapter. I want to extract just a few verses if you don't mind. Amen. Matthew, the second chapter, and as we look at Matthew, the second chapter, I want to extract just verses 1 through 8, and then we'll drop down and do verses 16 through 18, reading from the New King James Version. Here's how the Word of God reads, and it goes as follows. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7 says, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. If you would drop down to verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put uh, to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentations weeping and great mourning. Raquel weeping, uh, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. I want to use a tag on today's text used as a topic in the title, The Grinch Who Tried to Steal Christmas. Yeah, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the Grinch who tried to steal Christmas. Let us pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We honor you for this day, this opportunity to come and worship you yet once again. And as we gather and prepare ourselves to hear your preached word, we pray even now that you would open our ears and our hearts that they might be receptive to your teaching. We come against the enemy that he might not be successful in deterring or distracting. I pray, God, that as I stand as your mouthpiece, your ambassador, that you would use me for your glory. My mind, my body, my gift, everything that I have, I pray even now that you would use it, oh dear God. Now let the me inside of me sit down, the you inside of me rise up, and you go forth to deliver this message in the mighty, matchless, marvelous, majestic name of Jesus, who indeed is to Christ. Amen. 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 The Grinch who tried to steal Christmas. Most of us, if not all of us, have at some point in time, either as a child or maybe even as a youth or young adult, has heard the story of the Grinch. We're, we're familiar, most of us, I'm, I'm quite certain. 
and convinced that, that we've heard the story of how on the outskirts of Whoville live the revenge-seeking Grinch whose plans were simply this, to ruin Christmas. Yeah. The Grinch came down from his mountaintop home and he snuck into the town to swipe everything uh, that he possibly could, holiday-related, from the Who's. His ultimate goal was to take away the hope, the joy, the peace, and the love shared amongst the citizens of this town. Both he and his reluctant dog, Max, were on a journey to steal Christmas. But the Grinch never anticipated one of the citizens of Whoville. He never anticipated encountering Cindy Lou who, who changed everything. My brothers and my sisters, though this story, Dr. Seuss's story, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, while it is a mythical character, filled with mythical characters and a uh, fiction story, yet there is a Grinch personality, if you will. There's a Grinch spirit, if you will that existed far before Dr. Seuss wrote his book and later the movies were produced. There is this spirit that has existed since the creation of man, and that was even made more manifest in the times of Christ, whereby that spirit, that antichrist, that demonic influence, whose aim and whose hope and desire was to do just as the Grinch did in this story, that is to steal, if you will, and or to prevent Christmas from happening. Christ's mass, the, the coming, the advent of the Christ. It is the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of that fallen angel, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the devil. It is the spirit, that same spirit, that same mentality, and that same um, um, evil um, intent which desires to take away the hope, the joy, the love, and the peace, not from the citizens of Whoville, but from the citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen. Those that God has created, those who follow the Lord, those who worship him, it is the enemy's intent to take away that hope, that joy, that peace, and that love. We see it right here in particular in Matthew, the second chapter. For in Matthew, the second chapter, the Bible tells us of this man by the name of Herod who happened to be the king. King Herod had destined in his heart and had designed in his heart that he was going to find this Christ child and he was going to do away with him because you have to understand this, that there was, there was rumor and there was noise abroad that uh, one would be born unto the Jews who would become king, that would be the Messiah. And so Herod's kingdom, if you will, and or his position was threatened. And because it was threatened, he had made up in his mind, we need to find this so-called king, this so-called ruler of the Jews and or the Messiah, and we need to do away with him because I'm the only king in this town. Yeah, there's, there's, only, there's only enough room in this town for one sheriff, baby, and I am he, and no one else will come in and take my place. So what he did was he began to call on uh, the spiritual advisors and began to call on the uh, influencers and, 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 and what have you at that time and, and, um, and called them, told them, he says, go find out, go research, and um, tell me more about this so-called uh, Messiah, the so-called king of the Jews. And then he called on the religious crowd, and he says, tell me what you know about this. Tell me what your scriptures say about this. And they referred back where uh, in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem of Judah, it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you comes a ruler who would shepherd my people, Israel. So he heard it from the religious crowd, he heard it from the influencers and all those. And so the Bible says in verse 7, that's Herod, when he had secretly, when he had heard this, he had secretly called the wise men, <clears throat> determined from them what time the star 
should appear. And he told them, he says, all right, I want you to go and follow this star. And when you follow the star, and when you arrive to the place where this young child is born, I need you to get word back to me as soon as possible. He says, because when I find out, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to worship him myself. But we know, of course, that that was a lie. We know, of course, his heart was not set um, on worshiping the Christ child, the Messiah. He had evil intentions. My brothers and my sisters, that is what I'm referring to as the Grinch spirit and or this antichrist or demonic influence. It is that mindset and that mentality that wants to abolish and or eliminate anything Christ related. So if you are taking notes, I'm gonna give you just two points today. The first point is this, is that the Grinch, if he were, uh, and if you will, were to try in his attempts to try to eliminate and or to steal Christmas, he does so and or did so, first of all, by attempting to take the attention off of Christ. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to take the attention off of Christ. Why? Because I'm the king. I'm king here and I'm the ruler and no one else is going to come in here messing up the program and taking my position and taking the shine off of me. So his intent and his um, intentions were to take the attention off of Christ. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, that same spirit lives today. Yes. Because there are those that during this season, instead of celebrating the coming of the Christ, mm -hmm. Christ's mass, uh, if you will, the advent, the coming of the Christ, instead of putting the focus and, and, and attention on Christ, they seem to shift focus and attention on everything and everyone else. Now, I'm not here to be a killjoy. I'm not here to bust anybody's bubble. I'm not here to ruin anyone's holiday season. And I'm not here to make no parents mad. But parents, we need to tell the truth and tell our children what Christmas is all about. I'm going to be very careful and sensitive in what I say here today, um, just in case you have not told your children the truth uh, about what happens in North Pole. Y'all yeah, read between the lines, amen. They're not going to be um, talking bad about me saying the pastor just ruined Christmas for us and the babies are all sad and upset and what have you. But on the real, in the real sense and, and on the real tip, we need to tell the truth because everyone and everything else is getting the attention except for Christ. And Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. That's a good place for it. Amen. Amen. And so we have commercialized things and we go out and spend money that we don't have to buy stuff that we don't need to impress people that we don't even like. The sad reality is we spend all this money and we buy all these things and some folk go in debt trying to buy presents and gifts for these folk in many instances who are ungrateful in the first place. Have you ever bought a gift for someone and you gave them a gift and it wasn't the right size, it wasn't the right color, it wasn't the right gift, it wasn't the right, right price, it wasn't the right brand, and so they were so uh, offended and or ungrateful and unappreciative that really it was just a waste of your money and a waste of your time. The sad reality is not only do people find themselves going into debt, there's some people that are still paying for last Christmas this year and for the Christmas before and the Christmas before that. Wow. Brothers and my sisters, the sad reality is that the attention has been taken uh, away from Christ and has been placed on everything but Christ. Now, now, I ain't got nothing wrong with the, the Christmas spirit. Don't call me uh, Scrooge and all that. I ain't got nothing wrong with the Christmas singing and the songs and the and the caroling and the and the eggnog. Amen. <laughs> Y'all laughed at that. Y'all. I must add a little something about eggnog. Amen. Eggnog and Christmas cheer and, and baking cookies and all that stuff. All oh, that's nice and all that's wonderful. There ain't nothing wrong with going and looking at the Christmas lights and decorating the Christmas trees. There ain't nothing wrong with that at all. But let us make certain that our focus yes, and the focus.
focal point is not the Christmas trees, it's not the reefs, it's not the mistletoes, it's not the reindeer, it's not Santa and his elves and North Pole and any of that. Make certain that the focus and the focal point is Christ. Yeah. Because without Christ, there is no Christmas. So many would try to take the attention off of Christ. As a matter of fact, I guess Christmas is too long of a word. And so, so what they've done years ago is they decided we're going to shorten this word and we're just going to say Xmas. Do you find it not interesting that the most important, important part of the word, Christ, is what folk want to X out? I mean, it's not like it's a long word like super casual, fragilist, extremely out of the door. I can't even say the word. Y'all know what word I'm talking about. Most of us can't say it. Most of us can't spell it. And it's a long, complicated word. So I can see shortening something like that. But Christmas? Why, why must we take Christ out of Christmas? Because if we do, then there is no Christmas. Christmas is not Christmas without Christ. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's this mindset and this mentality and this Christ killer and this Christ stiller, if you will, that is running rampant. And so the, the spirit of the Grinch, if you will, who attempts to try to steal Christmas is one who attempts to take the attention off Christ. Let me say one more thing before I move on. When we were growing up, most of us, depending on what your age is, you know, we grew up in a, a part of this season. It was second nature for schools to have Christmas programs. And we looked forward to them every year. And we would have these Christmas programs and uh, singing songs and decorations and gifts and all kind of fun stuff going on. And I guess over the years, because of this spirit, this antichrist mindset and mentality, the Grinch, if you will, we find ourselves all of a sudden now wanting to downplay Christmas because we don't want to be offensive. We don't want to, we don't want to offend anyone. And we want to be oh so ultra tolerant that we want to make certain that we are not being politically incorrect. And so, what, and so what they decide to do is, uh, is to downplay Christ and focus more so on the holiday season and, and Santa Claus and all these other things and so on and so forth. My brothers and my sisters, if we don't have Christ, we don't have anything. Yeah. And so the schools have, 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 have done that. Uh, you know, it, it's not politically correct to talk about Christ and, and um, you know, government. It's not uh, uh, appropriate to talk about Christ in and, and all these different settings. And so we'd rather just focus on the holiday. You know, I even got sucked into that. You know, for a while I had stopped, you know, you just start saying happy holidays. And I had somebody that said, no, Merry Christmas. And I thought, oh, that's no big deal. It's just, you know, a matter of words, a matter of salutation, or greeting, what have you. But no, this is not just about the holiday season, the commercialized side of it. This is about Christ, and Christ must remain the focal point. Are y'all hearing me over here? So anyway, so, so, so Herod decided, I'm going to take the attention off of Christ, put the attention back on me. Everybody's talking about this Messiah. Everybody's talking about this Christ child that is to be born, this king of the Jews and what have you. And we ain't having that. So I'm taking the attention off. And he sent those um, fellows, those wise men to go to bring back words so he could, quote, unquote, worship. Yeah, if I could just throw this in parenthetically, there are those, uh, you got to be careful, of those who come to church, everybody that come to church, and everybody that is associated with religion are not necessarily Christ followers. Yeah. And everyone that wears a cross doesn't bear a cross. And you got to be careful because it's a whole lot of uh, uh, so-called uh, pseudo-righteous saints. Yeah, who, who, who really are not there for the right reason. And it is really self, uh, it's, uh, the focus is on self, and, or the focus is on the world, the focus is not on Christ. Are y'all hearing me on today? Yeah, and, 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 and so that's what, that's what Herod was up to. He wasn't trying to worship Christ. There's a whole lot of false worshipers up there. Everybody lift their hands, ain't worshiping. 
Yeah, everybody that closes their eyes and say, let's pray. Uh, some folk are not praying, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G. Some folk are praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. And you got to know the difference and be able to distinguish between yes. one who is praying for you and one who is praying upon you. Preach, Pastor Sandy. I'm doing the best that I can. And Herod's intentions were not right. His spirit was not right. And it was not about worshiping Christ. It was about uh, self. And it was about all, and it was about him. And, and he wanted to take the attention off of Christ. But secondly and lastly, not only does this spirit, this Grinch, attempt to try to steal Christmas by taking the attention off of Christ, but secondly, by turning the attackers on Christ. Or if I could put it another way, taking Christ out of the equation. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor Sanders? Well, if you take a look and drop down to verse 16, the Bible says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, he was exceedingly angry because God had intervened and told the wise men, Herod ain't right. Herod, Herod on something else. Uh, Herod's really trying to, trying to kill Christ. So don't listen to Herod. When you find a Christ child, you do what's in your heart, and that was to worship. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me just take a little quick detour, and let me focus on what the wise men did when they found a Christ child. Instead of going and doing what Herod instructed them to do when they found a Christ child, they did what anyone who has any sense or sensitivity would do, and that is to worship. When the attention is on Christ, it's not about the gifts. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's about Christ. And so when they saw Christ, they presented to Christ their very best. Yes. We've been preaching for the last couple of weeks about giving God your best. Yes. And if you don't give God your best, it is a reflection upon you. It is a reflection upon how you think and how you feel about God. And so these wise men, they were wise indeed. Not just because they were uh, wise in astrology and or astronomy and was able to find where the Christ child was. No, they were wise because when they came into the presence of the king, they knew what to do, and that was to bow down and to worship him. My brothers and my sisters, when you come into the presence of royalty, when you come into the presence of the king, not the king of England, not the king of this place, not the king of that place, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords, great Jehovah, when you enter into his presence, you ought not be able to stand straight up on your feet and look him eye to eye. No, you automatically begin to bow down and worship him. Why? Because he's God and God all by himself. He is great Elohim. He is Jehovah. He is El Shaddai. He's the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the self-existing God. No one voted him in and no one can vote him out. He will forever rule. His throne is perpetual. He is God. And he has no contenders. He has no competitors. He's God and God all by himself. And so when we enter into his presence, the only natural thing is, is to bow down and worship him. That's what these wise men did. They bowed down and they worshiped him, and they presented their best by giving their gifts and offerings unto the Lord. And so I, I, I ain't trying to be a killjoy. Buy your gifts. Buy for Sister So-and-so and Sally Sue and Jimbo and all the rest of them. Go buy your gifts and do all of that. But don't forget while you're out buying your gifts and investing in Target and Walmart and, 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 and everywhere else, don't forget the kingdom. Yeah. Don't forget the one to whom we're supposed to be celebrating. We'll go spend all this money. This, and, and here's the interesting thing. The folk that go and spend all this money and charge up their credit cards and all the other care on are the same folk who say, I can't afford to tithe. Yeah, I know y'all expect me to go there on Christmas Sunday, if you will. Same folk, I can't afford the time. I can't afford the time. But we can afford to go buy $200 Jordans for that little ungrateful child that won't even wash the dishes or take out the trash. We can go buy an Xbox or a, a, a PS, uh, what is it, PSP? PS4, that too. Amen. Ain't more expensive than PSP. Amen. Go buy that. You know, for that ungrateful child that, that, that can't do well in school, won't do well in school, but then all the cheat codes when it comes to San Andreas and, and all of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to tell you what I'm trying to tell you. 
But he was saying, for that, I can't give nothing to the church. I can't give nothing to the king. I can't, I can't afford that. You know, we, we, we flash that dollar on Sunday mornings, but we'll go and spend hundreds at the department store. Same folk who are broke. Same folk who ain't got no money for nothing else. But that's another sermon for another day. Y'all come back for that, all right? So anyway, uh, you know, they, they, they bowed down and they gave him their best gifts. Yes. If y'all haven't heard last week's sermon and the week before that, go on YouTube and listen to it about giving God your best. They gave him their best. Amen. Frankincense and myrrh and, and, and what have you. And they worshipped him and they bowed down before him. This was a baby in a manger. Yes. But yet they had sense enough to know that this wasn't just any old baby. This wasn't just any old uh, uh, young child back in Spartan Poland. This was the Christ You ought to change, watch this, how you act, and you ought to change how you talk, and you ought to change how you walk. Who's Pastor Sanders? I'm, I'm almost done. Listen, they changed uh, their, their action and their behavior because when they got there, they worshiped. They changed how they talk because their words were adoration toward the king. Watch this. But then they changed how they walk. Because after they was done worshiping him, God said, now don't go back to Herod. Go back to your own country. And so they walked. Watch this. But they walked in a different way. They walked, but they went in a different direction. My friends, when you come into the presence of Christ, when you come into the presence of the king, it ought to change the way that you stand. You ought to bow down and worship him. It ought to change the way that you think. It ought to change the way that you speak. And it ought to change the way that you walk. You ought to walk in a different direction. You ought not keep on walking in the same path in which you've been walking in. Amen. 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 Uh, I, I don't know about you, but you know, I'm, I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I should be. But I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Why? Because my talk has changed and my walk has changed. I may still stumble from time to time. I still may say some things that I ought not say from time to time. I may even do some things that I ought not do. But guess what? Uh, I'm a new person and I'm being changed. Amen. The seasoned saints used to sing it best when they would say, please be patient with me. For God is not through with me yet. But when he is, I will come forth. I shall come forth as pure gold. It is a process. And he's in the process of saying, listen, we have been saved and we are being saved. We've been saved when we place our faith in Christ. That means we're in the Father's hand. And Jesus said, who's ever in the Father's hand, no man can pluck him out. So we are saved and we are secure. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But we are also in the process of being saved. That is in the process of being perfected. I tell you this all the time, that on this side of eternity, we'll never be perfect and we'll never be sinless. The more we walk with Christ, the more we live for Christ, we ought to sin less as we are being perfected. Our lives are forever being changed as we're being molded and shaped into the image of the King. So we talk differently and we walk differently. We live differently. We think differently. That's what these, these men did. Come here, let me ask you a question. Are there any wise men here today? Any wise women here today? Is there anyone here who, who, who has wisdom enough and who has sense enough to worship the king when you enter into his presence and to give him your best when it comes to your worship and give him your best when it comes to your service and give him your best when it comes to your offerings, your gifts, your amen, whatever your gifts might be, your time, your talent, and your tent. Amen. amen. So, so watch this. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Take the attention off Christ. Turn the attackers on Christ, which is to take Christ out of the equation. They were, Herod said, okay, we sent some. They didn't come back. They deceived me. And uh, this Christ child is still out there. I'm not going to take no chances. So what we're going to do, we're going to wipe out all the young boys in the region and in the surrounding areas. Every young boy under the age of two, take their life. Okay, that didn't move you like it should have. Every child under the age of two, 
in particular male children, we're going to take them out. If I can just pause parenthetically to give me five more minutes on this, and if I can just throw this in for free, I won't charge you. I promise I won't. What we discovered is that the spirit to kill our boys is still running rapid today. That, that, that mindset of that mentality to, to, to kill our boys and, 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 and to wipe our boys out. I won't go down the path that, 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 I, that, I, that I want to go down. Amen. But there's a spirit, I tell you, that's running rampant. Yes, sir. And it's the same spirit that Herod uh, expressed and demonstrated in his actions. Targeting our young boys. Y'all, we need to pray for our young boys. We need to pray for them because if we don't pray for them, the gangs will pray upon them. We need to pray for our young boys because if we don't pray for our young boys, the jails are waiting on them. We need to pray for our young boys because if we don't pray for our young boys, what will happen is, is they'll fail in schools, the school will fail them, they'll fail in school, they'll not get their education or they'll be miseducated, they'll grow up in society and, and find themselves going down a, a downward spiral and, 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 and not being responsible fathers, not being responsible husbands, not being great contributors and good contributors to our society. We need to pray for our boys. Why? Because there's an anointing upon our boys. Our boys will grow up one day to be husbands and to be fathers. And, and, and to lead their households. Yeah. Now, I, I know we live in a day and age, I understand. We live in a day and age where, you know, we, we, we promote women's rights, which we should. Amen. Amen. We live in a day and age where, you know, women um, um, desire to be equal to men, which they should. I'm not taking that away. But watch this. When it's all said and done, God appointed the man as the head for a reason. And when it's all said and done, it's the man who was accountable. You can have equal rights all you want to, but it's the man who's accountable. And so we need to make certain that we are protecting and praying for our young boys because as they grow up to be responsible or irresponsible fathers or responsible or irresponsible husbands, amen. At the end of the day, God is coming to them and he's going to hold them accountable. You don't believe me? Watch this. Take, let's take let's go back to the garden. And here we are, Eve over there, fooling around with that snake. Sisters, watch out for them snakes hanging around. Amen. Some of y'all sisters hanging out with snakes and wondering why you keep getting bit. Yeah, that's another sermon for another day. Y'all come back for that one too. But she hanging around the snake, and the snake deceived her and uh, got into her head and all this stuff and carrying on. And um, Adam partook and, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, um, God comes up on the scene. He says, Adam, where are you? Yes, sir. Now, I just told you it was Eve yeah. fooling around with that snake. She's the one that sinned. But God calls who? Adam. Yes, sir. What you calling me for, Lord? She's the one that did this thing. Because I'm holding you accountable. You're the head. You're responsible for your household. And so I'm calling you accountable. I'm, I'm holding you accountable. And I'm calling your name. Adam, where are you? What have you done? And Adam did what some of those brothers do, the blame game. He was pointing at Eve. Eve was pointing at the snake. Yeah, so as, as some of the older preachers were saying, say, uh, you know, initially, because Adam blamed God, he said, well, it's the woman you gave me. I've had to use that sometimes, Brother John, you know, when, when first lady sometimes wouldn't, you know, yeah, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, amen. You know, Lord, you do know this is the woman that you gave me right there. But anyway, he, he, he was blaming the woman, the woman blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. And so they're doing the blame game and pointing at one another and pointing the finger, but at the end of the day, he says, Adam, what's up with you? It's the men who are being held accountable. So I went down that path just to reiterate this. We need to pray for our boys. Because our boys will one day grow up to be the men and the husbands and so on and so forth. So uh, lastly, and I'm out of here. He sends word to have them killed all these little boys and what have you. And, you know, the women were, as you would imagine, weeping and crying and wailing because their boys were being snatched from them. Their boys and their sons were being, were being murdered. All because King Herod wanted to take the attention off of Christ. 
put the attention back on himself. And all because he wanted to turn the attackers on Christ and take Christ out of the equation. That's what folk are still doing to this day. Trying to take Christ out of the equation. There's no other name that people get offended by but Jesus. You can go in any grocery store and say, here a Krishna all you want to. Father divine all you want to. And any other name. No one will pay much attention to you. Let somebody call on the name of Jesus. And folk begin to turn. And folk begin to get fidgety. And folk begin to get a little nervous. And folk begin to respond and react. And I don't know about you, but I've learned a long time ago, there's something about the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. The Bible says that the demons of hell begin to tremble at the very sound of his voice and the calling of his name. The Bible tells us that one day, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He, uh, my brothers and my sisters, there's no name, other name given under heaven whereby man shall be saved other than the name of Christ. Jesus. 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 Man's little baby. Jesus. The bright and the morning star. Jesus. He's the will in the middle of the will. Jesus. He's the lily in the valley. Jesus. By the name of Jesus, deaf ears will be unstopped. Jesus. Blinded eyes will be opened. Jesus. Lazarus will come from the grave. And I like when the older preachers used to say he had to call Lazarus by name. Because had he just simply said, come forth, everybody in the grave would have got up. That's the power that I'm talking about. There's power in the name of Jesus. The more you call it, the better you feel. The more you call it, you begin to see that your spirit relaxes and your mind begins to calm down. Just by calling on the name of Jesus. Don't take Christ out of the equation. Don't let this world convince you to be so politically correct that you are biblically ignorant. Keep Jesus where he's supposed to be. In the center. All eyes upon him. Yes. That's what I want to tell you on this Sunday before Christmas. Yes. I want to talk to you about the Grinch that tried to steal Christmas. Amen. You heard what I said. Yes. Tried to steal yes. Christmas. Yes. As a young folk would say, you tried that. Yes. Ain't, there's no victory for, 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 for Satan and his imps. The victory is in Christ Jesus. Yes. I told you when I was talking to you about the Whoville and, and what have you. I told you that the Grinch didn't anticipate one of the Whoville citizens. A young girl by the name of Cindy Lou Who. Cindy Lou Who was the hope for Whoville. Cindy Lou Who would become the rescuer, if you will, that not only saved the day, but saved Christmas. That eventually was able to turn even the old mean Grinch to turn him around. He discovered, after all, that he did have a heart. Yes. Well, the Cindy Lou Who of today is not some little mythical character, but it is the Christ. Yes. And in particular, the Christ in you. Yes. So as we go out this Christmas season, buy your gifts, do what you want. I can't, I can't compete against that. But you make certain that Christ is the focal point and you make certain that you are sharing and showing love to your fellow man and your fellow, fellow sister. Amen. And uh, giving them that hope, that joy, and that peace. You are the Cindy Lou of the kingdom, if you will. Amen? Amen. If you receive that, give God some praise.